I've just come back from Broome, which is a port on the West Australia's Kimberley coast, known for pearling tourism, and it's a base for the oil and gas industry. In the dry season, the warm climate lures southerners to escape winter, who arrive by road or through its international airport. Now on the northern boundary of Broome Airport is Gus Winkle Road. Brian Hernan, in a talk in 2016 entitled Broome Air Raid, mentioned Gus Winkle, so I knew the name, but not a lot about the backstory of Gus or why a road would be named in his honour. Gus was born in 1912 in Mentok in the Dutch East Indies, now modern day Indonesia. In 1935 he enlisted in their navy when he decided to join the Netherlands East Indies Air Force. At age 23 he qualified, became a pilot flying Lockheed Lodestars, ferrying freight around the Dutch East Indies in the years 1935 to 1942. In World War II as the Japanese advanced southwards this Dutch flight lieutenant was tasked to bring fleeing Dutch refugees from Bandung through Broome to Perth in that Lockheed Lodestar. His was just one of 22 aircraft in Broome on March the 3rd, 1942, in the morning when nine Japanese Zeros appeared and conducted a surprise attack on the flying boats on Roebuck Bay and then aircraft on the airfield. These nine Zeros made raid from Kopung a recently captured airfield in East Timor. When Japanese planes appeared overhead, Captain Gus happened to be servicing the plane's Colt 7.99 machine gun. The Zeros started their attack on the flying boats in Broome's Roebuck Bay, killing 76 Dutch refugees, including many children. Those on the flying boats faced death by bullets, fire, drowning and sharks. Winkle used this time to get his passengers to safety on Broome's airfield and knowing his plane was a sitting duck he removed one of the mounted machine guns and two belts of ammunition and positioned himself at a safe distance and waited for the inevitable Japanese fighters to turn to the airfield. He fired from the hip steadying the gun by resting the barrel on his arm. Winkle said when visiting Broome for the 60th anniversary well, I landed in Broome and I was taxiing back to the place where I was going to be refilled with petrol. I asked the attendant after seven and a half hour flight and I said, hey, is the RAF flying today? And he said, no, we, they are not. So I said to him, he said, raise the alarm, the jets are coming. And he looked at me and he laughed and he said, Ah, oh, no, they can't come that far south anyhow. But if he would have had and sounded the alarm straight away, a lot of things would have been a lot easier. I knew what was going to happen. <clears throat> so then I said to Charlie Fontaine, and Charlie Fontaine, that was my uh, mechanic, he said, open the bomb day doors in the front, you know, and throw all the luggage on the floor, on the ground, because they are going to uh, to uh, shoot at my plane and try to shoot it, to burn it. He says, so then their luggage is safe on the ground. Since about two weeks, we had an extra two machine guns at the rear end of the Lucky Losers. <coughs> and I went there and I took one of them out. And my wireless operator, Bill Max, he got the box of the 400 rounds of ammunition 303 and he put it on to the machine gun. And the machine gun was an air-cooled one, but it was also at the ring side. I took the gun and I went about 30 meters from the aircraft away up to the field. And there came one zero, very low, came over and, and I gave him the full blast of my machine gun the machine gun, and I knew I hit him, and he was laughing, but I thought to myself, not for long, anyhow. <laughs> so here you are, and he disappeared, and he was shot down, finished. 90 degrees, he came from and just in front of me. Have that as a present for me. Because of them, of course, I lost everything that I had in Bandung. You had to hold the barrel by your hand, see? 
and being air cooled and and all the bullets that went through it so it got getting quite quite hot. Several other zeros that came over the field. Several, see, until the whole lot was finished. And my hands were really, really painful, burned, you know. And, and there was a little later, there was an American doctor, and he saw to my hands, and he put some stuff on, on my hands to ease the pain a bit. Other zeros I shot at had to make a crash landing near Roti Island, because I must have hit his tanks, because they have no solid steering tanks. And he had no more petrol, and he had to land over there. He attacked the flying boats first in the harbor. See, they all had their 20 million, millimeter cannons and their normal 303 ammunition. So they hit them first with the 20 millimeter cannons, you know, and sunk them. And then uh, a lot of people got killed and maimed and all. Oh, that was really, really terrible. And then they came to the aerodrome. See, so I had the time to get all the thinking and get out to fix it at home until they came back. Warrant Officer Osamu Kudu was shot down and Yoseo Matsumoto ditched off Roti Island when his Zero ran out of fuel as a result of bullet holes in the wing tanks. Of the nine Zeros, all but one received bullet holes caused by Allied gunfire. Captain Takeo Shibata, who ordered the broom raid, said that most of his pilots did not survive the war. At the time of the Broom Raid, there were 135 residents in Broom, as well as 46 American military, 132 Dutch and 25 British personnel. In the two weeks prior to the raid, 8,000 refugees staged through Broom, and as many as 57 aircraft were there at one time. Meanwhile, Japanese forces were taking over Java and threatening the Allied headquarters at Bandung. On the 5th of March, the Allied commander decided that several senior RAF and RAAF officers had to be evacuated from Bandung. Winkle was chosen as the pilot. He protested the decision, arguing that his lack of rest would hinder his chances of finding Bandung in the dark, as he did not have any electronic aids. However, Winkle was seen to be one of the most experienced pilots because of his terrain knowledge as a flight instructor at Bandung and his recent refugee flights. Another factor was that his Lodestar, although it had been damaged in the attack on Broome, was considered the most suitable plane for the evacuation mission. Winkle flew to Java where he managed to land his plane at night on a road lit by Jeep headlights. He picked up 14 passengers, refueled the plane and successfully returned to Australia. Broome is not the only Australian town that fondly remembers Gus Winkle. Following the Broome air raid, Mr Winkle was based out of Moruya in New South Wales, from where he flew patrols of the Eastern Australian seaboard. It was on one of these patrols that Gus Winkle is credited with sinking a Japanese submarine. Post-war records show the Japanese did not suffer a lost submarine on the east coast the only full-sized submarine to be sunk was the I-124 off the coast of Darwin. The expected invasion of Australia following these air raids on Darwin, Wyndham, Broome, Columbaroo, Derby, Port Hedland, Onslow, Exmouth Gulf and Port Gregory didn't eventuate as the Battle of the Coral Sea in May 1942 and the Battle of Midway in June 1942 checked the Japanese expansion into the South Pacific. Winkle flew to the Dutch East Indies in late 1945 as part of an unauthorised recovery of Allied prisoners of war and internee mission. Winkle was searching for his mother and sister who had stayed behind but was unable to find them. Sometime later, another pilot flew over the Banjo Barrow internment camp and saw the name Nini written on the ground with flour. This was the name of Winkle's sister and to draw the attention of her brother, she had written the name. She assumed he was looking for her. Shortly afterwards, Winkle himself flew over the camp and dropped a letter to her following four days later by a supply of food. Today, a statue of Gus Winkle stands in Moruya to remember his bravery 
and that of the other airmen who fought in World War II in Australia. Gus Winkle was awarded the Dutch Gold Cross for his wartime efforts. He died in New Zealand, aged 100, in 2013. Truly a man worth remembering.